Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Carbon Farming Trials in Colorado, featuring Dan Mache and Mark Easter. I'm Linda Bilsons Brolis, Project Manager of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, uh, the Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be your facilitator. This webinar is the fifth in our series focused on compost climate connections. Uh, our first one, Compost Sequesters Carbon and Delivers Other Ecosystem Benefits, was September 17th with Dr. Sally Brown of Washington State University. This was followed by Calla Rose Ostrander talking about compost and carbon farming in California. Then Jessica Chiartas discussed new UC Davis research on how compost and cover crops sequester soil carbon. And earlier this month, we heard from Dr. Sasha Kramer of Soil and Dr. Rebecca Riles of the University of California at Merced about using compost for ecological sanitation in Haiti to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Today's webinar is the last one currently planned for the series. However, at the end, we'll ask for your input as to whether we should continue the series. We also offer other webinars to advance composting and to share working models and tips for replication. Many of these focus on supporting community scale composting. Dan Mesh will be touching on the importance of a distributed and diverse infrastructure for composting in his presentation. So I'll just say that at ILSR, we believe that supporting a network of decentralized facilities that includes home, community, and on-farm composting, as well as commercial scale is critical. This lens drives our work. All of our webinars are recorded, so check them out even after the fact. Uh, this is how you find them on our website. You'd go to ilsr.org slash composting, select from the composting resources drop down on the right hand side and select webinars. Um, and then while you're at it, check out other resources that we have up there, including reports, podcasts, presentations, and so on. Before we get started with today's presentations, we're going to ask you a few polling questions. The first one will be simply, did you join or listen to, the rec listen to the recording of any webinar in this Compost Climate Connection series? Then we'll ask a couple of questions based on information shared uh, on the last webinar by Dr. Sasha Kramer and Dr. Rebecca, Rebecca Riles. Um, they remember they spoke about using compost for ecological sanitation in Haiti to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So here's the first question. Uh, did you join or listen to the recording of any of the other webinars in this series. And we are just gonna wait till about 80% of you have voted. And I think we're good, let's call it. So it looks like two thirds of you almost, or three quarters of you almost have been uh, following along on the series, that's great. All right, so next question, um, going back to last, the last webinar. What are the climate benefits of ecological sanitation? Or this is via properly composting human waste. You're gonna select all that apply. Uh, is it reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as compared to pit latrines and waste stabilization, stabilization ponds, increase in local nutrient cycling and carbon sequestration, sequestration, sequestration such as when applied to agriculture and forest land, uh, displacing chemical fertilizers, supporting communities as they adapt to climate change, such as by improving resiliency of soil health and sanitation services. So which one is it? Or is it more than one? Just give you a couple more minutes. All right, so it's a pretty good spread. Uh, this is kind of a trick question. It's actually, all of them are true. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about ecological sanitation, you'll definitely have to check out the previous webinar. Uh, so one more question um, from, some, from information that we learned from that webinar. In informal settlements, the use of ecological sanitation mitigates what level of greenhouse gases per capita? Is it five kilograms carbon dioxide equivalent per person per year, 26 kilograms, or 124 kilograms carbon dioxide equivalent per person per year? What do you think it is? All right, let's go ahead. So, 
almost 60% are correct. It's 124 kilograms carbon dioxide equivalent per person per year. And this is comparing ecological sanitation or proper composting of human waste as compared to other waste management systems, even sewer systems. Um, and just a note that this does not include uh, benefits from reduction of fertilizer use or the benefits from carbon sequestration. So uh, lots of great information from that past webinar. Um, so definitely check it out. Uh, but at this point, uh, we're uh, moving on for today's webinar. Um, so in Boulder County, uh, in Boulder County, Colorado, EcoCycle and the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory, aka NRL, have established carbon farming pilot projects to adapt uh, the science used in the Marin Carbon Project in California for the Rocky Mountain climate. This webinar series, uh, sorry, this webinar will explore two of the pilot projects now underway, one on Boulder County agricultural open space and one on a citizen science project on urban land. Today's webinar will be structured a little differently than others in the series since Dan and Mark have been collaborating on these pilots. Uh, Dan will start by providing a brief intro for how these projects came to be. Then Mark will go through the findings of the Boulder County pilot. But since Mark has limited time, we will take a couple of questions for him at the end of his presentation. We'll then hand things back to Dan to talk about the City of Boulder pilot project and a couple of related citizen science projects. Uh, before we hand things over to Dan, uh, just a reminder that uh, please type your questions in at any time in the questions tab of your control panel. Um, and it's helpful if you are aiming the question at a particular speaker um, for you to say so in your question. So as Dan is taking things over, I'm just gonna do a quick intro for him. Um, Dan Mace directs the compost department for EcoCycle, a nonprofit recycler that works with cities along Colorado's front range. He also directs EcoCycle's Center for Hard to Recycle Materials, or CHARM. Um, based in Boulder County, EcoCycle has helped to establish carbon, far carbon farming pilot projects that adapt the science used in the Marin Carbon Project for Colorado's climate. Through its community carbon farming project, it is attempting to measure carbon gains in soil using carbon farming practices on urban land and utilizing a group of citizen scientists. Dan is also a founding member of the steering committee uh, for the Community Composter Coalition, which we at ILSR convene. So without further ado, take it over, Dan. Thank you, Linda. And can you hear me okay and see my screen okay? Absolutely, you look good. Great. Okay, um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you heard Kala Rose Ostrander uh, talk broadly about the connection between compost and climate change uh, in this series last month. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is some on the ground actions that are taking place in Colorado um, and the network that's forming around it and um, hopefully about uh, how you yourself can grow this network to include you working in your area. So. Um, um, as Linda said, I'm going to give a little bit of before I hand off to Mark to talk about uh, his project with Boulder County, I'm going to give an overview of um, how we got started with this and why, because there's a lot there's a lot going on in Colorado right now. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of an overview. Um, if I can advance my screen. Oh, there it is. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, Whoops, I'm going too far. Hmm. Okay, we'll figure that out. Um, so uh, my introduction to the connection between compost and climate uh, was when I heard uh, John Wick's presentation at the U.S. Composting Council Conference in 2014 um, about his Marin Carbon Project, which provided the scientific basis for the idea of carbon, carbon sequestration on ag land. Um, John's basic finding with the Marin Carbon Project was that a one-time surface application of compost on rangeland brings the soil to a new stable equilibrium 
of more microbial life. Um, and then that soil is then able to sustain more plant life and build soil, and it um, supercharges the soil's ability to store carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, marine carbon projects um, was really careful about the science, which I very much appreciate. Um, that you know they they were insistent on creating a, a strong scientific basis for this, um, and that basis suggests that. Uh, a global effort to build soil um, is probably our best uh, nature-based tool for reversing climate change. You've probably heard, you know, geoengineering schemes of um, filling, you know, putting aerosols in our atmosphere and whatnot. Um, but, you know, essentially what he's suggesting is, how about just building soil? Um, and uh, so you can see from the um, the, the bottom two um, photos in this slide that um, John's animals confirm that a more active soil also grows better tasting, more nutritious food. So if you can look at the picture on the lower right, um, the all the animal or a majority of the animals are in the composted um, sections of his trials there. Um, so John also understood that um, this effort has to include a way of paying farmers and ranches for, ranchers for this service of sequestering carbon. Um, so his early effort was to uh, connect um, carbon sequestration to California's cap and trade law. Um, that proved to be a little bit problematic. Um, with all the variability in agriculture, uh, you know, if it if it hails or if there's a drought, you're not going to sequester as much carbon as or your your, your carbon sequestration will change. Uh, so they found that you know, as opposed to uh, putting up solar panel where you know exactly how much fossil fuel you're offsetting, um, it's uh, it's a little bit tricky when you're looking at farming. So uh, I want to talk about that a little bit further. Um, so. Um, in hearing John's presentation um, at that conference, um, I, it was direction changing takeaways for me. Um, first of all, uh, what a sales pitch for compost. Um, you know, it was all we have been working for a long time on trying to get compost utilization uh, more into agriculture in my area. And um, so, um, so great sales pitch. And, uh, you know, that whole bit about uh, fixing climate change is is pretty cool as well. So um, around that same time, um, EcoCycle, uh, my organization, was looking. Uh, so so our 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 history, uh, we're of a 43 year history of working on waste issues, and um, more recently, uh, zero waste, how to get there. Um, but uh, lately, you know, with the urgency of climate change, our focus has changed to, you know, what can we do specifically about climate change um, uh, related to in our within our realm of waste? Um, so, and that's especially uh, brought to a head um, in light of the um, the latest um, IPCC assessment uh, from last fall that essentially we have until about 2030 um, to uh, to um, do something significant. Uh, to affect, um, uh, do something significant about climate change to to avoid the most serious effects, um, and that reducing emissions is no longer enough. We now have to we have to focus on um, on actually drawing down carbon dioxide um, to avoid the most serious effects. Okay, Let's see if I can actually get to the right slide. Okay. Uh, So uh, locally, um, here's this graphic is an illustration of the challenge that we're facing um, in trying to um, make compost collection uh, mainstream in Boulder County. Uh, and this is um, this is the same thing that that most of um, our nation's midsection faces, which is that um, if you look on the left. Um, our our landfilling costs. Yeah, our landfill is about our 11, landfill is 11 miles away um, from Boulder. Um, the 
uh, transport cost per ton is about 10 bucks. Uh, tip fee is 20 bucks. So uh, total cost to landfill is 30 bucks. And then if you look on the right side, um, that you have all of the costs associated with uh, our current costs associated with composting. So uh, we first go to a transfer station. They that um, transferring to a larger truck costs about 20 bucks. Uh, then the haul to a our compost facility, which is 52 miles away, costs 30 bucks. Tip fee there is 35. Uh, because you know composting is necessarily uh, more labor intensive than landfilling, uh, so so the total is you know closing in on three times the um, the total of landfilling. So uh, so this reality um, it 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 thwarts policy development on composting. Um, it thwarts compost sales to agriculture, uh, and it thwarts infra infrastructure development. So one thing that we've done in Boulder County, being a um, being a uh, collection of, of very progressive municipalities, um, you know, our solution has been well, we'll mandate it. We'll we'll require um, uh, curbside compost collection, and in in the city of Boulder's case, require um, uh, commercial business uh, compost collection. Um, so you can do that, but um, but with this economic disparity, um, you're going to get pushback um, until we have a different model. Um, and I think it's when contemplating a different model, it's worth contemplating that with planning, um, this is not the infrastructure that we would have chosen. Um, so here's what we have now in Boulder County. And this is representative of, uh, you know, this is the prevalent model uh, across the U.S. In that uh, there's a there's a distant compost facility that's already there, um, and and compost collection programs um, develop independent of that compost facility, and then hope that the compost facility will will take their stuff. And the compost facility um, is uh, is you know was intent the, the business model of that compost facility. Uh, probably with something completely different from uh, taking um, urban food and yard waste. Um, for for instance, in our, um, uh, our for our compost facility, their business model was specifically to compost um, the organic waste from Coors Brewery. Um, so they they had no intention of of taking on food waste and yard waste uh, when they when they started. Um, and so the, um, the, the difficulty aside from this, from the, from the cost of getting to their, uh, to the, to a distant compost facility, uh, the difficulty is that, uh, well, for better and for worse, uh, that facility is, it's out of sight, uh, it's out of smell and it's out of mind for the generators. So if you were to actually, um, plan for a compost facility, maybe you do something more like this, where each community um, or perhaps each county has its own compost facility. And, you know, I think there's a few different models that that could potentially work, um, you know, could work more like a utility. Every community has a wastewater treatment plant. Why doesn't every community have a, a compost facility that operates like a utility? Um, the work that we do um, with our, uh, uh, with ILSR, um, is is more is focused on well is there sort of a um, is there is there a community based um, style of compost facility and there's you know that's that's a flourishing model there's a, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on there and you and I think uh, most of you um, have some experience with that um, so the but the thing to to recognize uh, that if you're actually composting um, locally. It requires a different compost system uh, with more controls uh, than a windrow system has, um, so that it can site in a in a semi-urban area. Uh, besides cost, another driving factor locally um, is to try to take meaningful action on emissions. Um, you probably know that landfills are a major source of methane, um, along with combustion. Uh, if you put that into CO2 equivalents, that's about 5.4% uh, of, of U.S.'s total uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, then you look on the ag side, um, there's a lot of emissions on the ag side as well. Um, that is both in um, 
soil mark soil management and manure management um, agriculture uh, is especially in the nation's midsection it is um, it, it's driven by commodity markets um, they dominate most of our ag land um, and those markets do not place a value on building soil or integrating uh, farming, integrated farming, such as um, providing for animals and pollinators and uh, regeneration that we know we need. Um, it's driven by worldwide competition. You got to be cheaper than China and Brazil. Um, so as a result, we have a lot of concentration of um, uh, resources such and, and wastes, such as with uh, confined animal feed operations. Um, and there's uh, specialization, not diversification. Um, so um, there's an opportunity here. We can solve two pro. If you look at um, beyond ways to uh, to look at what's happening in agriculture, uh, there's there's two major problems that we can potentially solve here. Um, one is that um, organic waste in, in, in landfills and lagoons are a major source of greenhouse gases, and that modern farming and land management uh, cause topsoil loss worldwide. So to talk specifically about um, what we're doing in Boulder County, um, you're not going to be able to uh, make much sense of this map, but um, I'll tell you that the the left half of this map, so this is a map of Boulder County, the left half of it is all mountains, the right half of it, um, the so you see the green, I'm sorry, the uh, the gray areas, those are the uh, those are the cities. And then all this green, all these different shades of green, those all represent um, publicly owned open space, agricultural open space. Um, we have tried to isolate ourselves from Denver and Boulder County uh, to uh, try to diminish, um, uh, minimize uh, urban sprawl. Um, the municipalities have bought a lot of, of, of their agricultural open space and they've leased it back to farmers. And that, so that is an opportunity that we have um, we can take advantage of our, our this substantial open space uh, to demonstrate and educate to farmers um, how to um, how to how to uh, incorporate regenerative ag practices um, and and involve uh, politicians and the public in this. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to hand over to Mark now uh, uh, because uh, you know the uh, we brought this idea to uh, Boulder County Commissioners of how do we, um, you know, could we take advantage of the fact that we that we have, that we own all this open space to to trial some of this? Um, and we had questions of, you know, does the Marine Carbon Project science need to be replicated or do we just, um, do we just take it and run with it? What do, what do we need to do? So um, uh, by happy coincidence, I learned that, um, Colorado State University, um, NREL was actually intimately involved with the um, bringing the Marine Carbon Project data um, to a, a state level. Um, so, and and Mark uh, was um, was intimately involved in that. So, I will um, hand it over to Mark now to talk about what he's doing with the county. Awesome, thanks, Dan. And as uh, we're handing over the controls to Mark, let me introduce him. Uh, Mark Easter is a senior research associate at the Natural Resources Ecology Lab, also known as NREL. His work focuses on greenhouse gas inventories and greenhouse gas decision support systems in agriculture and forestry. Uh, Mark contributed analysis to multiple United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, reports on greenhouse gas inventory methods and has contributed to national level inventories of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and forestry in the US, Brazil, Kenya, Jordan, India, Spain, and Italy. He's the project coordinator for the Comet Farm Project and technical lead for the Carbon Benefit Project and collaborates on the Comet Planner Project. And we are so happy to have him. So take it away, Mark. All right, thank you, Linda. And uh, I really appreciate that introduction. And uh, thank you, Dan, for that great um, setup for all this. Um, can you all hear me okay and see my screen? Sounds great, and you uh, look great too. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, all right. So, um, 
Just a real quick about our research group here. We're part of the Natural Resources Ecology Lab, um, or NREL. We have the same acronym as the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, uh, but we were formed about uh, a decade earlier than that. We're a grant-funded research institute that's part of the Warner College of Natural Resources here at CSU, and our team is led by uh, Dr. Keith Postgen, who's a professor of soil and crop sciences. Um, so I'm going to describe for you with Dan's, I think, you know, great setup. I'm going to describe some of the work, some of the research that we've been doing on behalf of uh, Boulder County and the city of Boulder. Um, I'm going to talk about, first of all, um, some carbon farming methods for the Colorado Northern Front Range that emerged from a feasibility study that we did, completed in uh, 2017. And then um, talk about a compost on rangeland experiment that came out of that and a carbon farming producer-based trial that uh, came out of that as well. Um, the project goals um, for this work were really to try to understand a couple key things. First of all, can compost applications on rangeland lead to carbon sequestration and support rangeland restoration in the Northern Front Range? Um, and then the second question is, um, based on what we've learned about carbon farming practices, um, what are the best ones that work in our area here? And how can we best integrate them into the uh, cropping systems that are already in place uh, here in the Northern Front Range? Um, the practices that emerged from our feasibility study were, there were five of them. Um, it was to apply compost. Um, and specifically compost that's generated from diverted landfill waste. That's either diverted food or yard waste or other types of organics. Um, uh, using cover crops in the shoulder seasons and uh, basically keeping a living root in the soil 365 days a year. Um, reducing tillage or converting to no tillage systems. Uh, where fertilizer is used, to use slow release fertilizers to the extent possible, and then adding windbreaks wherever possible. Um, all of these have uh, an important carbon sequestration benefit and, and to varying degrees have uh, different economic benefits for the producers. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about those methods and just talk about what we learned with regards to compost in particular. Um, these five practices um, lead to, in the context of carbon farming, lead to higher soil organic matter. They improve soil structure, um, leading to tighter soil plant nutrient cycling. Um, what producers across the board have, are starting to discover is that with higher organic matter in their soils, through carbon se sequestration, um, Starting before very long and uh, improving as time goes on, there's reduced need for inputs. There's reduced need for fertilizer. Um, plants are healthier. There's oftentimes less need or the need for uh, certain pesticides can be eliminated um, in, in many cases. Um, producers are also seeing higher yields. Um, and that is due to a number of different things, potentially due to tighter soil plant nutrient cycling, but also through improved water holding capacity and improved water infiltration that comes from the better soil structure and the higher organic matter in the systems. Um, so the, there are other carbon farming practices that work in other parts of the country very well, but these are the ones that floated at the top here on the Northern Front Range, in particular in Boulder County. Um, I'm going to talk about just some of the findings from some work we did for Boulder County and the city of Boulder 2014 and 2017 around the different ag cropping systems. And this slide shows what the greenhouse gas emissions are under conventional systems. Um, and focusing on that alfalfa row crop conventional till, which is the dominant uh, cropping system that's uh, on irrigated systems in Boulder County right now. Um, when um, producers convert over to carbon farming, we find that on an acre basis, adding compost has the potential to add um, up to about three, three tons of CO2 equivalents per acre. Um, and this is uh, typically over a period of about 20 years. Um, utilizing nitrification inhibitors and tillage reduction has a lower benefit, but the benefit is real and it um, 
very often leads to uh, cost savings for the producers and the cost of requiring less fertilizer, less fuel costs, less equipment costs for the growers. Um, cover crops have a more significant benefit um, and uh, with again with varying um, economic benefits for the producers. The greatest practice on a per acre basis is to add windbreaks into these systems and that is um, because of the carbon sequestration and the woody biomass that comes from um, from uh, adding trees into these systems. Um, um, I'm going to take a, a deep dive into um, compost and the relative benefits for the systems and then I will um, go into explaining some of the experiments that we have going here um, and then wrap up with questions. Um, so what I want to ask you to focus on the left hand bar here that's labeled irrigated cropland. Um, this was the basis of a, or this is the results of a life cycle emissions analysis we did for ag applied compost in Boulder County. And it shows seven different emission sources or sequestration opportunities. Um, so whenever um, compost is used, there um, is a potential for emissions. Um, there's some embodied emissions associated with equipment and facilities in order to um, set up to compost uh, and, and transport material. Um, there's also some fuel use that's required, and um, there are um, nitrous oxide emissions um, associated with the um, uh, with the production of compost, depending on the method that's used. But the the um, aeration method that's um, that's described and most likely would be used here in uh, Boulder County. Um, uh, would lead to uh, soil nitrous oxide emissions. And that shows the three sources of emissions at the top of that bar. Now, um, below that though, below the line, the zero line, um, the dark blue um, shows avoided landfill methane emissions. And that is the greatest, we see that as the greatest potential benefit from composting uh, uh, organic waste that's diverted from landfills. When you add that, to um, avoided emissions from um, manufacturing fertilizer. And on top of that, the carbon sequestration benefit associated with putting that compost into uh, food production. We see the combination of those three um, significantly overwhelm the emissions associated with the utilization and production of the compost. To the, and the total benefit is um, on a hectare basis, it's about six and a half metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per hectare per year, or about, um, about three short tons or English tons of CO2 equivalents per acre per year. And just for a reference sake, um, the typical US car, just on an average basis, emits about four to four and a half tons of carbon dioxide equivalents over the course of a year. So um, a single acre is, uh, is uh, sequestering or offsetting about um, two-thirds to three-quarters of those emissions associated with an automobile. So at scale, you can see that the benefits of this are pretty significant. Excuse me while I take a drink of water. So, um, and this is a, sort of a repeat of some of the things that Dan was describing. Through composting, the agricultural benefits are improved soil health, higher soil organic matter, higher, higher soil water holding capacity, and higher crop yields. Um, avoiding landfill rate waste reduces landfill maintenance costs and extends the life of landfills. Um, recycling a crop and forage nutrients um, avoids the expensive, very energy intensive process of manufacturing synthetic fertilizers. And reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions from all of this comes from carbon sequestration in soils, avoiding landfill methane, avoiding fertilizer manufacturing emissions, and uh, potentially if you're manufacture if you're using livestock manure in the composting process, avoiding manure methane from emissions in dairy lagoons. So I'm going to move on and talk about the two experiments that we have going. So the first one is um, essentially we're um, extending the research that has come out of the Marin Carbon Project in Northern California. Um, 
a, a few years ago, uh, based on those findings um, and in a project led by Dr. Wendy Silver at University of California, Berkeley, they've extended the findings into a study where they've applied compost and controlled experiments um, to sites, I think it's 13 different ranches up and down on rangeland up and down California. Um, and there's been an effort nationally to, that's led by Cala Rose, Ostrander, and others to extend those experiments to other regions to demonstrate the benefits and assess the, the, the potential sequestration value in other ecosystems and soils. So we identified two sites, um, DeBerry to the north and Mayhofer to the south in Boulder County, the two ex extents of the county where um, we could apply compost to soils. Um, the first site um, uh, is, a, is a site of degraded rangeland, um, and this gives you um, a better look at it. It's a deep wind deposited clay loam that's been moderately degraded uh, primarily by a combination of creation pressures from livestock and from prairie dogs. The second site um, is much further south, um, and it's a gravelly, cobbly clay loam. It's near rocky flats and has the same soil series as there, and it's moderately to severely degraded. And that shows our uh, colleague team member, Matt Sturmer, um, at the site. Similar sorts of issues degraded by a combination of livestock grazing and uh, prairie dogs in these sites. And so um, uh, we uh, applied the compost this year. It's just, the experiment has just gotten started. We collected baseline soil samples um, last fall installed grazing exposures and the soil samples have been processed and our next steps are to uh, take soil samples in April of 2020 and vegetation samples in July of 2020. And then we will be uh, co collecting additional samples at two years intervals after that. And again, we're extending this to the work that uh, Dr. Wendy Silver is leading from Berkeley. Um, the carbon farm trial that we have going is a little bit different. Um, the, the issue that we're trying to pursue, what we're trying to find here is really discover working with actual farmers. We're trying to understand um, what are the issues that farmers may come across in incorporating these carbon farming practices, those five practices into an existing system. Um, and there's just a tremendous amount to be learned working with growers, with skilled growers, um, as they go through the process of incorporating this into their systems. Um, we understand about what things are easy, what things are difficult, and where the road, potential roadblocks might be. Um, so the study is at Quicksilver Road. It's uh, south of Longmont, Colorado, and the producers are Paul and Scott Schlegel. Um, it's a, it's a field that um, has been in a relatively typical irrigated agriculture system for, for the Front Range. It's um, corn uh, followed by sugar beets, um, uh, typically some type of a, a small grain like barley uh, for malt production, and then followed by several years of alfalfa, and then the whole thing repeats. Um, so they've identified two five-acre carbon farming uh, plots with controls at either end of the field. Um, so they've been, we've uh, began applying compost. Um, they've applied cover crops. Um, we're in our second year of the system now. Um, they've had already begun reducing tillage and they're using a combination of fertigation and slow release fertilizers, which significantly reduces trace gas emissions. And then in discussion is the um, planting a windbreak and pollinator strip on the north side of the field. Um, and so, whoops, excuse me. Um, so the current status of this trial is uh, we've applied the compost. We've been moving through the um, application of the cover crops. Um, corn was planted in late April of 2019. A cover crop was terminated in late May of this year. Corn silage was harvested in October. And then another um, winter crop, triticale, for seed was planted in early October. And that's performing essentially the same role as a cover crop in the system. And so what we're predicting, and I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump to the results. Um, uh, we're, we're seeing some um, significant yield and nutrient quality trends. The highest yield increase was on compost and the compost plus cover crop. Um, and the silage nutrient quality was also higher in those systems. So wherever there was compost applied, and especially in addition to, with a cover crop, 
Um, we're seeing both higher yields and a trend towards higher yields and a higher, significantly higher uh, nutrient quality in the silage that was produced. Um, and this shows what we're predicting the greenhouse gas benefit reductions are going to be. This is within the farm gate. So this does not include avoided emissions from landfills and avoided emissions from fertilizer manufacturing. This is just the net carbon sequestration and trace gas emissions reductions. So the greatest benefit is a combination of reducing tillage um, slow, using the slow release fertilizers and fertigation combined with the cover crop and the compost at about um, two and a quarter um, metric tons of CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. Um, and again, that's about half the emissions associated with a single, um, a single car over the course of a year. Um, and then uh, the smallest um, uh, reduction that we see, the smallest benefit comes from uh, cover crops, just the cover crops. And um, so with that, um, I'm just going to um, put a, try to put an exclamation mark around what the benefits of carbon farming are in these systems, and particularly utilizing compost as the greatest benefit for um, across the board in a number of benefit categories, including greenhouse gas emissions. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. And I'm, unfortunately, I have to leave um, a little bit before one o'clock um, for um, another meeting that I couldn't avoid, I'm sorry. But happy to take any questions you have. No worries, thank you so much, Mark. Um, so we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, I wanted to start with a question that I've been uh, thinking about for a while. A lot of the research that we've shown over the course of this webinar series comes out of uh, California and now Colorado. And I'm wondering how uh, relevant this research is for, we're based on the East Coast and the Mid-Atlantic, um, mm -hmm. and how we could maybe bring these sorts of trials to our communities wherever wherever we might be yeah that's a great question and uh, thank you for asking that that's really important um, so um, first a real practical answer I would talk with Cala Rose um, she's on the leading edge of extending these trials to other parts of the country um, and the second is that what we found through the modeling work and through analysis of studies that have been conducted around the country and literally around the world in this space, um, not just involving um, cover crops, not just involving tillage reductions or slow release fertilizers, but also involving you know, utilization of livestock manure, utilization of compost, is that these benefits um, extend to virtually everywhere they are applied to varying degrees. It just depends to some degree on the soil. It just depends to some degree on the climate, but probably the biggest factor is the cropping system, whatever the agricultural system is there, whether it's just producing forage crops through pasture and rangeland, or whether it's um, a combination of forage crops and annual crops like corn and soybeans and wheat, or just annual crops. That's probably gonna be the biggest driving factor and also the availability of a, of a supply of materials for producing compost. Um, the Comet Planner tool um, can help uh, provide some assessment about what the relative benefits of those might be. And you can access it via www.comet-planner.com. That could give you a rapid assessment of what the relative greenhouse gas benefits could be in whatever region you might have to be in in the lower 48 states. Awesome, thank you very much, Mark. Um, and there's a couple of questions, couple of questions uh, about the compost um, that you are basically the compost that's being used in your project, in your pilot. Um, what was the feedstock for the compost and how often will the application, will it be applied annually or is it a one-time application? That's great. Yeah, great question. Um, so the feedstock is provided by A1 Organics. It's their EcoGrow product. Um, and you can see the specifications on it um, at the from the A1 Organics website. Again, the product is EcoGrow. A significant portion of the feedstock is diverted landfill waste. 
It's a combination of food waste um, and um, as bulking agent, um, uh, uh, wood waste that's been chopped up. Um, and Dan may be able to provide some more details around that. Um, it's a, between one and one and a quarter percent nitrogen at the, uh, on a wet weight basis as applied, um, also a significant source of phosphorus and other um, trace minerals, um, essential plant minerals that are really important here on the front range. Um, the oh, the application rate, I'm sorry, I'll just follow up with that. Um, on the carbon farm trials, the rangeland trials, we're applying at the same rates as were applied in uh, the marine carbon project. Uh, we're applying a quarter of an inch um, across the across the entire across um, two plots at each site. Um, each plot is a uh, half acre in size, and so quarter inch equates to um, for these trials about 17 tons of compost uh, per uh, per hectare. So about a little over eight tons per acre. Um, and um, in our carbon farming trials, we're applying at differential rates depending on the crop. Um, for corn and sugar baits, it's, it'll be between 12 and 18 tons per acre, um, again, depending on the crop. For um, small grains like um, triticale and for barley, it's going to be between four and eight tons, depending on what the soil tests indicate, what the crop demands are. For alfalfa, there will be um, a small application rate. It'll probably be on the order of two tons, and that's primarily designed to meet the phosphorus, potassium, and trace mineral needs of the crop. That's on a per year basis. On a per year basis. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, the, um, the, I'm sorry, I should offer a clarification. For the, for the compost on rangeland study, it's one application uh, initially, and we'll reassess at the end of 10 years and determine whether a second application will be needed at that time. So for the rangeland uh, study, it's just a one-time application, basically. And then right. for the uh, the carbon farming trials, it's an annual application. That's correct. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, it looks like we've got one more question for you um, before we can let you let you leave. Uh, and that is, are any uh, is microbial activity or any sort of microbial populations being measured in any way in either study? Yeah, um, really interesting question. So the Boulder County is um, uh, at the Quicksilver property where we're doing the producer-based trials. They are examining how the microbial population has uh, changed at those sites. Um, and at the um, uh, we haven't done that initially at the compost on rangeland study, but we expect to do that next year, um, comparing the controls versus the um, uh, the compost application sites. Um, there is some question as to what the most appropriate um, soil tests are, uh, and there is some new research that's coming out now, particularly some research that was reported at the um, Soil Science Society of America last year, and I believe the paper is is about to be released or is maybe in press already. Um, that um, it, they're basically the upshot is there needs to be some work on um, on the existing soil tests we have to assess uh, microbial populations because it's not really clear that the existing soil tests are informing informing us well in that space, particularly for dryland agricultural sites, and so. Um, I'm going to, we're going to be looking very carefully at what, um, how the research trends in that space uh, to try and select the best possible tests uh, that are out there. But there's some question as to whether the, um, the Haney test and some of the others are really going to inform us well, particularly for dry land, for on rangeland, and for dry land agricultural systems. Great. And this leads me to ask the, the results of your two studies, um, where Will, will these be studies, or will, they, will the results be publicly available at some point? Yes, yes. The compost on rangeland studies, uh, the results are going to be integrated with Dr. Silver's work, um, and they will be published um, in, as a compilation. It, it will take several years for the, uh, for the results to be uh, compiled because we simply, so, soil changes, it's a, it's, a, it's a giant ship, and it's, 
uh, changes in soil organic carbon, they're difficult to detect in less than three to five years. The changes do occur over those times, of course, but it's difficult to scientifically detect them um, in a period less than three to five years. So we expect those will be published in a, in the longer time frame. Um, the, but we will be publishing uh, results um, as time goes on with Boulder County, and um, and they certainly make uh, the work that they do publicly available. Um, and then the that we report to um, the various uh, commissions within the state or within the uh, the county around the progress in the uh, at the quick or quicksilver side on the producer-based trials, and um, the results of that um, are typically available um, through Boulder County through their website. Wonderful. Uh, we're working with the collaborative to improve or increase uh, adoption of regenerative practices here in the Maryland area. Um, so um, we will definitely be looking with interest to see your results. Um, we, we do have a couple more questions that have come in, uh, I, but I want to respect your, your time. I don't know how much more you have to give for us. Um, I've, I've got about two more minutes and then I'm going to run. I could probably take one question and people could, if you could send the questions or just forward the questions on to me and I'll answer them and then you could distribute them. Yes, that works. Um, so let's go with, uh, could you please explain the benefits of the windbreak more? Why was yeah. that such a big uh, impact? That's a that's a great question. Um, what we what we find with windbreaks is um, particularly when they're planted adjacent to irrigated fields. Um, once you get the trees established, they grow very quickly. They tend to accumulate carbon at a, a much faster rate than soil does. And so, if it's just the equivalent of watching a forest grow through the process of photosynthesis, the trees are taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they're storing it in the trees. Um, we also see a stabilization effect underneath the trees. The, 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 we tend to see an increase in soil carbon uh, going along with the above ground increase. Combined with that, uh, there's been some interesting research out of the University of Nebraska that's been repeated in other places that shows that um, particularly in windy places like the Colorado Front Range and other parts of the Great Plains, um, when you plant trees as a windbreak adjacent to fields, you tend to see the um, significant benefits for plant production further out. You send, tend to see higher yields. You, basically what's happening is the, the, the crops are able to utilize this water that's in the soil that either fell as precipitation or was supplied as irrigation. The water use efficiency goes way up. You tend to see uh, crop yields increasing between uh, 10 and 20, in one case as high as 30% increase, just from having a strategically placed windbreak up, um, upwind. And so that higher plant production tends to lead to higher carbon sequestration in the soils as well. So there's a, it's a twofold increase, two, twofold benefit. Wonderful, that's super interesting. And uh, thank you so much, Mark, for uh, sharing your expertise and for taking the time to to present with us today. You bet. I'm delighted. And thank you all for your careful attention. Wonderful. All right. So let's hand things over to to Dan again. Dan, you might need to accept the invitation. Okay, we back? Yep, looks good. All right. Um, so I want to talk about some other projects that we have going on in the area. Um, so Mark was talking about uh, this one at the top here, Boulder County Carbon Sequestration Pilot. That was focused um, on conventional farmers, which is a logical thing to do, given that that um, the you know the vast majority of uh, broad acre uh, farming is conventional, um, but uh, not to be outdone, the city of Boulder wanted to do a, a pilot, uh, some experiments on their op agricultural open space. They wanted to be. Um, 
they they wanted to work with some farmers who are already doing this stuff. You know, talk to uh, look, what do we do, how do we get uh, the organic farmers, the regenerative farmers that are that are already trying to do this stuff? Um, how do we get them involved? Um, so um, I'm just going to give a brief synopsis of what they're doing. Um, they, uh, as Mark said, um, we have a uh, an issue in our area with um, historically overgrazed parcels that are now um, badly overpopulated by prairie dogs. Um, so, uh, and they, you know, prairie dogs um, evolved to follow the bison and, and, and now they're landlocked. And so it's a real, it's a real issue here. Um, they, uh, as it turns out, you know, the, the regenerative and organic farmers in our area are on the more marginal land. So they're the, they're the ones that have uh, the prairie dogs, you know, in the in the fields surrounding them. Um, so it's an issue for them. Um, so um, they sort of um, um, organically evolved into this, uh, looking at a new um, uh, contract between uh, the the farmer and the um, and the open space owner, the city of Boulder. Um, so rather than just simply leasing the land as is as the general practice, it's looking at um, an actual uh, restoration services um, contract with or with regenerative farmer uh, as a neighbor. Um, so so they're uh, you know far, these these um, organic farmers that want to expand, but but all the fields around them are uh, either they're really literally desertified. Uh, so if they can get them back up to uh, productive, then then they can lease them. So um, so that's the that's the effort that's going on uh, with City of Boulder, um, and then um, there are actually two citizen science projects going on. Um, the first, uh, so the one up here in the uh, upper left, um, it is still um, an an ag based um, trial. So so these are um, the citizen scientists are farmers, um, and it's it is essentially just trying. It's 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 getting farmers to um, to make a commitment to doing the same soil test um, annually for ten years. And uh, as Mark said, there's some question about what is the correct soil test to use. Um, what what they selected was uh, Haney uh, PLFA. The PLFA part is the you know, someone asked about a microbial. Um, test. Uh, PLFA, I believe, um, stands for uh, polylactic fatty acids. That is a, um, um, uh, it's looking at fatty acids as markers to indicate uh, microbial activity in the soil. Um, so that's, um, that's what they're going to do. And, and then they, um, they share anonymized results. And, and the, the intent is to get farmers, uh, allow farmers to showcase that what they're doing um, is is building soil, uh, which leaves me uh, with the the uh, the project that EcoCycle is doing uh, that I'm going to spend uh, the rest of our most of the rest of our time talking about, and that is the community carbon farming campaign. Um, so um, we it's still looking at the marine carbon project as the as the model and and trying to scale it to um, to urban land. Um, so what we're asking is, um, can we measure the potential for carbon sequestration in urban land? And then, of course, there is a great opportunity for um, for outreach to get some non-farmers um, uh, aware of this opportunity. Um, so our goals um, for this project, <clears throat> um, so there is a science aspect. Um, so what is the potential for uh, for urban land to store carbon um, and to do other ecosystem services as well? Um, you know, uh, City of Boulder is aware that um, uh, Boulder Creek, you know, City of Boulder is is right up against the mountains. You would think there would not be a lot of um, fertilizer in um, in the creek that runs through it. Um, coming right out of the mountains, but uh, there's actually quite a bit, and it's from you know private citizens um, what they're doing with their lawns. Um, so um, so looking at um, looking at changing that, um, and can we produce um, can we can we produce a model that's viable for other communities to reproduce? Can we can we do the citizen science project in a way that other um, communities can? Um, 
can engage with as well. And then we are um, also working um, on growing this movement. Um, so um, the interesting thing about this is that um, the, the focus can be tailored to, to different audiences. Um, so that number four um, here, um, so one audience, uh, so farmers might be most most interested in, uh, you know, how they how can they build soil? Um, another audience might be uh, little uh, Boulder's audience is is very focused on on uh, climate change. There's no there's no denial in this area. People want to know what can what can I do? Um, there's a lot of uh, people who contacted me who say, you know, I have a I have a um, you know, a one acre rural residential lot. What, tell me what to do with my land. Um, and then there's there's some people who maybe they don't want to talk about carbon sequestration, but they they still care about the food that they eat. Um, so they would be interested in hearing about how, um, uh, once, when you're building soil, uh, you, you have a more nutrient dense uh, food. Um, so you can engage, so, so these three um, ways of looking at it, it's all the same thing. It's all about building soil. Uh, and then lastly, um, we uh, there is a there is obviously um, a great opportunity for education here. Um, so our participants can learn about their own soil uh, in their yards and in their gardens, um, that it's alive and active. Um, that's news for a lot of people. Um, and then. Um, the larger goal is to create a, a consumer market demand um, for using compost and and for agriculture that uses that uh, for regenerative agriculture. Um, this is a really interesting um, thing because, as I mentioned, uh, you know John Wick from Marine Carbon Project was interested in how do you um, how do you how do farmers get paid to do this um, and and the difficulty in connecting it with um, with uh, California's cap and trade law. Um, so I, I think there's there's some fascinating work going on. Um, these uh, a lot of it is um, developing open source um, agricultural based apps um, that are that are intended. Uh, they're they're trying to verify um, on ground conditions. So verify you know what is the um, uh, how much soil is 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 being built? Um, how much carbon is being sequestered? Um, and then there's other ways to look at it. Um, it was I say, uh, you know, um, nutrient density is part of this. Um, so if you can verify the nutrient density of a crop um, versus um, a nutrient density of, of the same crop coming out of a, a field that's that's not um, having these regenerative uh, practices apply to it. You know, if there's a difference there, then people will that that you can verify. Then people will pay for that. So um, uh, there's some really fascinating stuff going on um, in that space. Um, so here is our uh, here's the, here's the trial design. So um, over here on the right, you see um, all the participants uh, that we have in this citizen science project. Uh, we have um, we're, there's actually two different trials. One is a three-year trial, and this is um, this is the end of year one, by the way. Um, so we have about 200 yard farmers. They are um, doing trials on their um, uh, lawn or turf or uh, uh, grassy open spaces, uh, and then we have uh, uh, 20 garden farmers doing uh, a similar trial, uh, a little bit more intensive. Um, in their gardens, um, for each project, um, they they can uh, choose one of five treatments. Um, so you can see uh, compost is one of them, and then there's these other four. Um, they are um, so they're doing um, plant growth surveys. We we send out a little survey every two weeks and and ask them to measure plant growth. Um, that is not really science it's more anecdotal it keeps them engaged uh, but it's interest there's some interesting results and um you know we're we are finding that um there is a <clears throat> at the end of year one um we do see a marginal increase in plant growth um, for all five treatments versus a control um so 
but then the um, actual science is we are doing uh, soil sampling. Um, we are we did a, a spring baseline soil sample, um, and then we did a fall soil sample that we just finished uh, a couple of weeks ago. We're going uh, zero to ten centimeters, and then ten to twenty centimeters as as well. Um, and we're measuring three things: we're measuring soil respiration, uh, which is basically you know the the you're you're measuring how much carbon dioxide is exhaled by the soil. Um, so that is a that is a measure of overall uh, soil life. Um, then uh, soil organic matter, um, which is measured by percentage. Um, and then total carbon, uh, which is uh, if you're if you're if you're um, trying to um, trying to map your carbon sequestration, that's what you're after. Total carbon is a is a subset of of organic matter. Um, so here is a here is a typical um, trial site. This is actually my backyard. This is my trial. Um, so it there is a, a ten foot uh, treatment side and a 10 foot control a 10 foot by 10 foot control side uh, we we take the samples from um sort of the middle of each of those and you can see from this slide that this is not um that an individual site is not um it's not an ideal um scientific it's not an ideal site from a scientific perspective um it is you can see there's variable shading um it's small um, there's a lot of stuff going on around it, um, but the idea is that um, with enough of these, um, there will be, um, uh, you know, we, we can start to learn, uh, we can start to learn some things about the about the potential for um, for urban land, and 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 the idea is that it, yeah, they're they're not they are representative of typical um, urban sites in our area. Um, there are some challenging logistics to this project, I will say, uh, for anyone who, who is interested in reproducing it. Um, at EcoCycle, we happen to have a uh, very engaged group of volunteers that we've um, always counted on for the last 43 years to help um, uh, send our message out to the to the public. So we um, we got about a dozen people trained on on um, taking soil samples, so they went and visited all of these sites, um, delivering treatments and taking samples. Um, and we are, um, so what we're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, we're, uh, the soils, um, this the soil, tests are that cell test data is going to a new database um, that is looking for a correlation between growing practices and the nutrient density of the food um, of uh, grown in those um, in those plots so we're, we're contributing to a larger effort here um, that so there's not a lot of data right now other than the anecdotal um, growth uh, trials um, so, so what we're doing, uh, our next um, next up for us is uh, so this winter we're compiling our first year results um, with this database. Um, we are um, uh, importantly we're creating uh, online resources for for our participants and for other communities. Um, this is this is the key for maintaining engagement for three years. Uh, to feel like you're 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 part of this effort going on. Um, this is very much like uh, um, the beginning of the recycling movement. You know, this is what where EcoCycle was 43 years ago is what it feels like. Um, getting people engaged about composting. Um, so we will we'll have an online um, resource for people to uh, to look up their um, their soil test results and understand what they mean. Um, then we are um, we're going to add some other apps. There's one here, uh, Land PKS. Uh, it helps you to further analyze the site. It tells you how much is it an opportunity to be able to record for you know how much shading, you know, what's the orientation, what's the slope. Um, we are going to add some um, 
spaces that are uh, that rather than backyards, they are um, urban open space, we're calling them, such as in a park um, that is um, better. Uh, so, so that particular um, um, trial site will, will, will be better science, um, i.e. it'll be uh, in full sun, it'll be flat, uh, it'll be evenly irrigated, and that way we'll be, be able to kind of vet our results. Um, and then, um, you know, we are ultimately looking to uh, to share this model with other communities. Um, and then, in the last couple of moments, I want to move beyond our um, our citizen science project to um, kind of the the larger effort. Um, there is the question about um, you know how to engage in your other in um, in other areas. Um, there's a lot going on um, under the name soil health. So the, there's a lot of words you can't say in ag, um, like carbon sequestration. There's a lot of farmers who don't who, who aren't there yet. They don't want to talk about it. Um, so soil health is sort of the buzzword. Um, so if you go to um, this website here, it will tell you um, the all the healthy soils programs uh, going on nationwide. Um, so you can look on out. Uh, you can look look up what's happening in your state um, and um, get engaged. Um, and because this is not directly related to um, this, this uh, healthy soils effort is not directly related to compost use, I encourage you to, when you do get involved, make sure that compost use is part of um, the, the conversation. You know, it was in California, um, that is the model. Um, and and we need to make sure you know keep the drumbeat for for compost um and i just will also mention one other thing in my last uh, couple of minutes here um we are also working on some state legislation in colorado we have a bill um that will that is um going to be introduced to the legis to the general assembly uh in january um which is to look at um um, can we uh, create an organics management plan for the state? Um, so that is that is what we do is what we did as a first step um, with the Boulder County project that Mark described. Is we um, uh, Cal Rose and I uh, did a, a countywide assessment looking at what are all the feedstocks that we have and what's the best uh, what, are, what are the current economics of them and and what's the best use for those feedstocks. Um, and um, you know some interesting um, uh, local situations that we have. We have a um, uh, emerald ash borer that's killing all of our ash trees. Um, that is creating a lot of wood waste. Um, so you have to. Um, so you can then plan for. Um, you can see the increase in in wood waste that we anticipate as a result of that. Um, and so ultimately, you know, I think this is this might be best represented in, in a heat map of, you know, here's all the um, here's all the um, here's all the feedstocks that we have statewide. Um, here's the population centers. Here's the uh, compost facilities. Um, here's the um, uh, wastewater treatment plants. You know, those are those are all sources of, of uh, organic waste. So. Uh, once you look at a heat map, like, like you look at Colorado, for instance, here, you see these giant orange um, circles. Um, so those are all uh, dairies and feedlots and other confined animal operations um, there, and they are all uh, um, creating, you know, massive amounts of manure. And you can see, you know, very quickly compared to these little green um, uh, dots, which is more um, uh, food waste composting, uh, it's really, um, there's a lot more manure than there is food waste in Colorado. So it kind of, you know, helps you helps you with your perspective. So I am going to stop there. I think that's, oh, one more slide. Very important. Um, so we're not going to succeed in this effort um, of carbon sequestration without creating the market-based incentive for farmers and ranchers to build soil that I mentioned earlier. So, and that can happen in a, a variety of ways. Um, right now, the only income that they have is over here in crop sales. 
Um, if we can create a carbon market, uh, fantastic. If we can't do that, and I mentioned that there are some difficulties with that, if we can better quantify compost benefits for farmers, that's helpful. Um, if we can um, work uh, with market-based solutions that, that, um, that stimulate regenerative ag, such as putting a, um, a premium on uh, nutrient density of of, um, of crops, then that can that can get us there as well. Uh, so, and that is my final slide. So thank you all, uh, and I'll take any questions. Awesome, thanks, Dan. Uh, before we go to questions, um, we were going to do a few polling questions um, of the participants, including. Uh, questions about whether we should continue the series and what uh, we might focus on. So I'll wait for Virginia to get loaded. There we go. Okay, so first question. After this webinar, how inclined are you to uh, select all that apply, start composting, learn, learn more about composting, reach out to composters for additional information, or support composting? including ecological sanitation is not relevant here. Uh, that's left over from the last one. Uh, wait for a couple more minutes. Right. Let's go ahead and call it. So 93% Supporting composting, including ecological sanitation. Just kidding. Supporting composting. That's great. Um, wonderful. Okay, so next question. As an overview of field trials for carbon farming, this webinar had select one. Too much information, the right amount of information, not enough information. Right. Well, let's see the results. So great. Most people said that this was a good enough uh, amount of information, um, but there is a chunk of people that want more. I think I'm in that camp as well. Uh, there's only so much we can cover in this amount of time, but this also then leads into the next question. Um, given this is currently the last planned of the Compost Climate Connection series, do you want us to continue? Yes or no? I'm gonna wait for a little bit because this is an important question for us. Just another minute or so, 30 seconds, 20 seconds. All right, let's call it. And 100% says yes. So I think that we're going to have to continue. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, directive. Uh, we we accept that challenge. Um, the the last question. So if yes, which seems like we're all in agreement, would you like us to add one or more focused on policy and or action steps? I feel like a lot of our presenters have peppered in this kind of information, but we have been focusing largely on the science behind um, uh, carbon farming and compost. Um, so that is just something that we've been thinking about for the next one to really focus in on what you could be doing, how to bring this information and make it relevant in your community um, and put, put this great research to use. So we'll wait another 15 seconds. All right, and it looks like most everybody would like to hear that, 2% um, says so they're not interested, but that's okay, you can you can skip out on that one if, if we do that topic. Um, great, well, thank you so much for participating in that poll. Um, and now we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, and Dan, uh, so we'll have to parse through which ones are for, for for, for you, Dan, and which ones might still be for Mark. But um, the first question is, how are you measuring the percentage of organic matter in soil? 
Okay. Um, so the uh, we're working with a lab uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michigan called OurSci. Um, so they're measuring it. Um, there are a couple different ways of, of measuring it, and um, I to have a um, better answer, I would actually contact them uh, if you're if you're asking specifically how um, you know w which method they are using. Um, I would contact them. Um, I'm not. I'm not a lab scientist. No worries. Thank you for that answer. Um, there is a question about how did you build momentum on the citizen science project? It sounds like EcoCycle has a history of doing this kind of stuff, but I don't know if you have any tips for folks. Yeah. Well, we. You know, we we have a history of engagement with our community, um, but we it not you know it's it's on recycling. It is not on uh, on and composting uh, in terms of collection. Uh, it's not on um, you know utilization of compost um, or or certainly agriculture. We are you know that agriculture is my background, but it's not uh, it's not a um, strength. Of, it's not something that the community looks to EcoCycle for guidance on. Um, but I, um, in our community, um, and, and especially amongst our um, our membership, you know, this this engaged group of volunteers that we have, um, there is a there's a tremendous interest in doing something. They just feel like, you know, the they they hear the bad news every day. The clock is ticking. Um, they they want to feel like, um, you know, they want to have hope. Um, so. Uh, so we engage people on hope, um, you know, just, um, you, you know, I think the Marine Carbon Project, it was uh, an amazingly eye-opening and hopeful um, uh, thing to learn about for me. And and so we're, we just share what we've learned, We you know, uh, as, as non-experts in this field, um, you know, we say, hey, this, this looks like it's worth checking out. And, and that's, you know, be, whether we're talking to our membership or the um, county commissioners or state legislators, we just simply relay, you know, this is what we've learned. Um, and we would like, with your help, to take the next step. Um, so, you know, not um, you know, putting on any pretense that that we have the answer. Uh, we are simply um, engaging people, and we don't honestly know exactly where we're going with this. Um, and and you know, that's that's the exciting thing about it. It's 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 cutting edge. It is very exciting and very inspiring. Um, we have uh, a pretty. A uh, simple question. It says, uh, "What is the company in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that you mentioned? I think it's RRS, not they had written down RSI. Is that correct, Dan? Uh, it, um, RRS is in our, Ann Arbor, but uh, the this the lab is our Sci O U R S C I, as in our science. The, this lab is focused on, you know, I mentioned that um, there's all these open source." Um, data gathering um, software devices that are being developed and and that's their focus is um, they want to um, aggregate data that is um, that's coming out of these apps and and uh, and Mark's um, uh, office at, at Colorado State is is in, is engaged in the, is very engaged in this as well is uh, it's it's developing um, you know this open source software um, and sharing it broadly uh, with the idea being uh, they're very adamant that nobody owned this. Um, nobody owns the data um, about carbon sequestration. So, um, so you know, it's that we, uh, we all can contribute to it and we can all learn from it and share with it. So it's, it, yeah, it's, it's uh, O-U-R-S-C-I. Great, thanks for that clarification. Um, like the use of open, source information um yeah a couple of questions that i have for you um is one uh i think in your timeline it looked like you all were um trying to create tools or information for other communities that potentially wanted to replicate these kinds of studies in their communities right. 
Wonderful. And what kind of a time frame is that on? Um, well, we're going to, um, I think that the safe answer is um, towards the end of next year, we will have a, uh, we expect, we hope to have a package coming together that we can share with other communities. That doesn't mean, you know, certainly if you're interested, um, contact me now and, um, you know, I, I think we can, we can talk about what we can do um, in the meantime. Um, but we are, um, you know, I, our focus right now is, is, you know, can we, can we make this a little bit less of a logistical issue for people uh, who might want to reproduce it? Um, can we, um, uh, can we um, simplify uh, a little bit on the, um, um, well, you know, just, just polish it up a little bit before we, before we share it broadly, but, um, but certainly, uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out, out to me if you'd like to talk about um, doing something for next year. Great. And then another question. Uh, uh, it looked like you were having folks try one um, sort of practice or application um, in a citizen science sort of project. It looked like from Mark's uh, research and I think what we've seen in some of the other webinars that it's really the combination of a lot of pr practices together that really mm -hmm. yields the highest benefit. I don't know if that fits into your planning for the future of this project. I don't know if that's too complicated to measure. So I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I think, uh, you know, so our, our first question is, you know, can we measure uh, carbon sequestration happening on urban land. Um, so to keep that as simple as possible, we are, we are just, um, we're just applying one of those five treatments. Um, I think certainly there's the opportunity um, as we start to get to, to get data and the data starts to steer us, um, you know, we, we can look at, um, yeah, more adding more complexity, um, but right, but, um for an individual plot you know there's already so much variability um you know it's somebody's backyard uh, and and you know there's buildings around it and there's you know a, a dog peeing in it and all kinds of stuff so um so we're yeah we're, we're keeping it as simple as we can right now but understanding that that is absolutely true it is a um it's a it's a combination of um practices that that give you the uh, the most sequestration and we'll we'll figure out how to how to work that in um as we go wonderful well it's a great opportunity for folks to feel like they're contributing um to uh, this big crisis that we are all affected by so um i think that looks like all the questions that we have right now so um, thank you so much, Dan, for for participating. Um, we will definitely be keeping tabs on how this goes. So um, I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to say in closing. Uh, just thank you all for your interest and and don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you more. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, Dan, and thanks you. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>